Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this episode of Really Dicey. Today, we're going to talk about two new subclasses that Matt Mercer has added to D&D Beyond, Paladin, Oath of the Open Sea, and Monk, Way of the Cobalt Soul. And I haven't read these yet. I figure we're going to try something different and give you kind of our first reactions uh, uh, to these subclasses. And I'm excited to see what um, Matt Mercer has put together. And yeah. my name is Manny, and this is the great... Vander, the generalist. Uh, thank you again for joining me talking about uh, D and D. Yeah, always, cool. especially with uh, critical role stuff. And like people who have, may have seen our other videos, I am a big critter in the community. I, I love my critical role. So these aren't like brand new to me because I know enough about the characters that I've seen a little bit of this. Um, but for you, this is basically like fresh off the boat, literally, right? Like, yeah, definitely. All right. Paladin, oh, to the, why can I say that? Paladin, oaf of the open sea. Um, you want to you say oaf? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, the oaf of the open sea calls to seafaring warriors, swashbuckling sailors, and journeying guardians who seek the thrill of the endless horizon, trying to seek the adventure and mystery across the beneath every endless oceanic expanse. Palins will swear this oath stand against those who would deny the liberties afforded to like-minded travelers, rooting out the tyrannical and corrupt that claim any shore. Such guardians believe in the natural beauty of the sea, often making offerings and prayers to entities or deities like the Wild Mother or Stone Lord that influence safe passage, while often feeling called to hunt those monstrosities that seek to terrorize and spoil the waters with wanton violence and ill intent." So the, the fun thing about this, or at least what I am used to, except with, I think, Oathbreaker and maybe Ancients, a lot of Paladin stuff are usually very lawful, uh, where these kind of, this one specifically, the Open Sea, has a little more of that chaotic element to it. Like, there are, there are the rules, there are the, the tenants, like, right underneath that we have, but even the tenants themselves are very much be who you are openly adventure seek uh be active be um explore the uncharted like be active in your world shape it enjoy it and it's a very different spin for a lot of the different oaths um so i enjoy it already so the four tenants that we have are no greater life than a life lived free trust the skies adapt like the water and explore the uncharted uh I think, like, even without reading the descriptions, which by themselves do give you quite a bit more information, uh, right there you can know that you know you're putting your faith into something, but it doesn't mean there is a specific rule of law that you're technically following. Or at least, if I had a character playing this, I would not make them have to be lawful. I would allow a decent amount of variance, and mm. I, I like that. Um, so let me ask you something, Vander. I'm 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 trying to picture this subclass in my head like like what would it look like what would it act like and i'm trying to find uh, a link uh, or or some sort of source where a, an example actually that's a probably better word an example of this in either movies or uh, tv shows or something like that or books and i'm trying to picture it um but i'm, I'm not coming close so i'm trying to think like what's what will be the per i mean i think the idea of a paladin of the seas it's fantastic fantastic idea uh, so many adventure ideas from it, but I'm trying to think. I'm just trying to think. What's the template to base so, this off of? Here, here's what I could. The best way I could describe it. You have Captain Jack Sparrow, who is a rogue swashbuckler. You have Captain Barbosa, who would be an Oath of the Open Seas paladin by comparison to me, someone who tr does trust the sea, someone who is in charge and is shaping their own destiny all the time. Not that Jack is ever not doing that, but um, he's a little smarmy. He's a little quick. He's a little uh, more charming and a, a little more tricky where um, there's still the charm, especially with the paladin, you know, charisma, but um, there's a power behind it. There is a sense of almost like a sense of destiny and, uh, you can basically a captain that's what i would say more than anything else is you very much get the vibe of a captain of a ship um or at least someone who wants to explore the open waters and trust them and to me that feel it feels barbosa to me maybe not to other people i guess it depends how you read that character um but i could totally see if barbosa was in the D, D world i could 
see this being an avenue that he would take. All right, excellent. So let's um, let's take a look at what they can do. What they're yeah. so that's the oath spells. You gain oath spells at the paladin levels listed in the oath at the open sea spells table. Um, so let's see, makes sense. These spells, yeah, if they make sense. Create yeah. super water, uh, misty step, call lightning, control water. Yeah, that that's that's yeah. typical. That makes the, sense. The themes seem to be either water slash lightning based or freedom based, which is like the big theme with those two is like expeditious retreat or freedom of movement. Those are made so you have more control over your surroundings and you're not being tied down. Where, you know, Misty Step also related to that, but also a little water related. You have Create Destroy Water, Tidal Wave, Control Water. None of these spells are like outrageous, like powerful, but they fit the theme, I think, really well. Yeah, it makes me think a little bit like, all right, so let's say Poseidon, like he will have his worshippers, his clerics, but then there would be, there will be an army, there will be some soldiers to protect these water kingdoms. And I can see um, this this type of paladin being of those types. Yeah, like a human or a triton mm -hmm. that like almost like a demigod descendant type deal. All right. Channel divinity. You get these at their level. You can pick one of two of the of the of these options. One of the you gain the following two channel divinity options. Uh, marine layer. As an action, you can channel the sea to create a thick cloud of fog that surrounds you and heavily obscures the area of twenty feet in all directions, following you as you move. You and all creatures within five feet of you instead treat this fog as lightly obscured. This fog lasts for 10 minutes, spreads around corners, it cannot be dispersed. Okay, interesting. Yeah, um, it's a, I think almost like a reversal of what we're talking about with like the being tied down or not being tied down theme. This very much is uh, give myself the capability of to move freely, but restrict others in a way type deal, which I like and still sits with the, uh, the mist, the water, the sea theme. Um, Plus, uh, it's unique. It's it's kind of like fog cloud, but you have a very unique features along with it. Like if you have people with you, like if you have a team that's moving with you next to you, uh, you guys are being able to see at least a little bit clearer where everybody else can't. So you could be able to like move forward with like say you and a person flanking you on each side, and like your opponents have disadvantage on attacks. You have advantage. Uh, I don't know. I, I, just one of the potential uses that I'm thinking of. Okay. Fury of the Tides. As a bonus action, you can channel the powerful might of the waves to bolster your attack for one minute. Once per turn for the duration, when you hit a creature with weapon attack, you can choose to push the target 10 feet away from you. If the target is pushed into an obstacle or another creature, they take additional bludgeoning damage equal to your charisma modifier. Aura of Liberation, starting at 7th level, you have an eight and aura where you're not incapacitated. You or any creature of your choice within 10 feet of you cannot be grappled or restrained, as well as ignore penalties on movement or attacks while underwater. Creatures that are already grappled or restrained when they enter the aura can spend five feet of movement to only escape non magical restraints. So, no cracking attacks for you. Exactly. You're not getting <laughs> tangled up in nets or ropes or things like that. It's they, they are keeping with that, that theme, that sea theme, very well. And it's a very unique aura compared to like the other ones that you see with the other um uh os i mean each of them are unique in their own ways to do unique features but I, I i you don't see a lot of things that mess with your movement or your ability to be like incapacitated or grappled a lot so it's nice to have like a little uh a little different capabilities it's yeah. not insanely strong unless you're against certain creatures but like against those certain creatures it's insanely strong. <laughs> um, it, so, so you pay attention more to critical role than I do. Um, is there something going on eventual wise that is, is that's very sea heavy at the moment? Um, yes. Yeah, so with both of these characters, uh, the way of the Cobalt Soul, the other one has been around since the beginning and those abilities have been around since the beginning. And the kind of fun thing about that is we've seen that subclass develop over time over the last basically two years um this one is literally brand new besides reading it today and what little i've seen in uh episode 112 113 um there's not 
uh, there's not a lot being done with it yet, but they have been on the sea quite a bit. So some of these have come into play. A lot of them have not yet, but also the character who uses these is not high enough level to use some of the stuff yet. So <laughs> Stormy Waters at 15th level, you can call crashing waters around you as a reaction whenever a creature enters or exits your melee, your melee range. The creature takes 1d12 bludgeoning damage and must succeed a strength saving throw or be knocked prone. Okay, all right. I like that because um, as a reaction, you're setting up some interesting stuff there. Uh, I would want to double check the wording on that to see if you have to be near waters or are you just summoning them to crash up? Everything else doesn't specify that water really needs to be there, but it says you can call crashing waters. And I'm just like, if you're on a volcano, do they just appear and knock somebody over? Or, you know, or like you're in a fighting in a desert. Would, would, that, would that make sense? Um, that's a good question. Um, hmm. That I'm not sure. I guess it'll be up to the game master, the dungeon master to decide. Um, uh, but the idea of knocking someone prone. Uh, could be fun you, like that's using your reaction to give other people advantage on attacks could be a, a fair trade if it works hmm. all right and then at 20th level mythic swashbuckler at 20th level you learn to channel the spirits of historic sea captains to briefly become a paragon of heroic adventure as an action you embrace the spirits of the sea gaining the following benefit for one minute climbing costs no additional movement and you have advantage to strength checks Athletics. If you are within five feet of a creature and no other creatures are within five feet of you, you have advantage on your attacks against that creature. You can take the dodge action as a bonus action. You have advantage on all dexterity ability checks and dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see. Once you use this feature, you cannot use it again until you finish a long rest. Um, it's it's cool. Mm, I don't know. It's for 20th level. I don't know. I just. It is not powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and like e even me reading it like I'm a big fan of these potential things but like it's not like compared to like let's say Ancients where you get like some pretty strong stuff for uh, uh, your final level stuff um, this definitely isn't nearly as strong uh, it's I guess for me I'm getting used to and I'm still getting used to the way 5e handles 20th level like Back in my day, <laughs> but with the dinosaurs and everything, um, um, when you're hit like the last level, usually at that point, like fighting gods uh, and you know ancient dragons and uh, an army of Tarrasque and whatever. Um, so whenever they did this, whenever they, I notice whenever 20th level comes around, it's I always get like I always get like a. It's not just this class. I feel like all the classes sometimes I feel like it's like oh, okay, it's cool, you know, but it's not crazy like. I remember it being, um, but but I'm maybe going off topic. It's, but this case of Mythic Swashbuckler, I wish it was something a little more extra, but it's it's, it's fine. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, there there are certain things. I think I think the theme works. So no additional movement to move, advantage on strength checks. Uh, you can take the dodge action. It, it's all sitting with that theme of being slippery. Even though like you're you're strong, but you're also slippery. You're uh, ease of movement, able to dodge, uh, and the, the part of being like five feet within five feet of a creature, but nothing, no other creatures around you. It kind of has that idea of you being the captain, of you being alone in the front or alone on the side and dealing with a problem by yourself, type of thing. So it's very much like you're you're a one on one combatant in this in the mind of this thing. Yeah, uh, which is interesting because a lot of the other abilities work when you're surrounded by people like your aura helps people when you're around them and uh, your other capabilities like the stormy waters uh, to knock someone down is usually to to be prone but something to help others normally it could help you too but um, it's giving a lot of weird versatility when it comes to movement and being restrained and being grappled and dodging, it's, it's all almost movement based, which is interesting. It's like trying to give you different a different type of control of the battlefield that's not specifically damage, hmm. which I think is interesting. Uh, I'm not saying this is perfect. I'm sure we will see some changes, but I 
am always excited when new things like this come out because it's just a different it's a different view on paladin that like i'm not used to at least but again like you said you you have dinosaur years when it comes to dnd i have three or four years by comparison so uh to me every new and shiny thing is just fun yeah yeah and i, I like the, the imagery of these like uh spirits of historic sea captains coming to join up and help you i think visually like a, a dungeon master describing that sounds pretty pretty awesome um you know, I wish it wish the effect was just as awesome as <laughs> that sounds. Um, okay, all right. So let's check out Monk. Let's see what Monk Way of the Cobalt Soul, which sounds great. Uh, again, this is some I'm, I'm not familiar with this also, although, like you said before, yeah, it's, it is well known in Critical Role circles. Uh, I believe the first Critical Role book, which the name is going to be Tal Tal Role Day. Um, um, you know, it has this, but this is a much more expanded version of it, uh, or updated version of it, I should say. Um, so let's let me go ahead and scroll down, and I will read. Driven by the pursuit of knowledge and the worship of the knowing mentor, the archives of the Cobalt Soul stand as some of the most well-respected and most heavily guarded repositories of tomes, history, and information across Exandria. Here are young people seeking the clarity of truth and the strength of knowledge pledged to learn the art of seeking enlightenment by understanding the world around them and mastering the techniques to defend it. To become a cobalt soul is to give oneself to the quest of unveiling life's mysteries, bringing light to the secret of the dark and guarding the most powerful and dangerous of truths from those who seek to perverse the sanctity of civilization. You know, I have to say, this is my first time reading it and it's very easy to read. You can tell they've Someone's practice read this out loud. Um, the monks of the cobalt soul are the embodiment of the phrase, know your enemy. Through research, to prepare themselves against the ever coming tides of evil. Through careful training, they have learned to puncture and manipulate the spiritual flow of an opponent's body. Through understanding the secrets of their foe, they can adapt and surmount them. Then once the fight is, once the fight is done, they return to record their findings for future generations of monks to study from. Beginning at their level when choosing this tradition, you can strike pressure points to extract crucial information about your foe, match your insight about their combat ability. Whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks branded by your flurry of blows, you mark them as analyze. Whenever an analyzed creature misses you with an attack, you can immediately use your reaction to make an unarmed melee strike against that creature. That benefit lasts until you finish a short or long rest. In addition, you learn the following attributes about the target, damage vulnerabilities, damage resistances, damage immunities, and condition immunities. That is very interesting, and I like that a lot. But that, when I think of martial arts, some aspects of martial arts, depending on form or or combat style you use, that that's actually one of the things analyzing your opponents. That's that's pretty cool. Glad you like it. Uh, yeah. Um, well, at least critters and myself, we've seen this being used for quite a bit now. And um, one thing, like Matt doesn't. Matt Mercer does really well is like with the uh, oath of the o ocean of the open ocean uh, oath of the open sea. Um, he stylized it a lot around movement and being restrained and and stuff like that. Here with um, the uh, monk of the cobalt soul, the way of the cobalt soul, it's all about learning your opponent's weaknesses and stuff. And the more you get into that, the more related to that you get. And I it's a very different way to do monk where like monks are never considered stupid or unwise, especially with high wisdom. But this puts that to uh, uh, both a role playing and potentially a more useful um, skill use instead of just purely always through combat, which I like. Yeah. I, I would like to see that expanded. Like I think with a good dungeon master, when, when a, a monk is analyzing you after they do this uh, this uh this attack, I would like to like I I would just like add more like you actually know more than just you know how to beat it, but know why it is the way it is maybe like 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 more of a spiritual look, you know I I mean I mean that's how I would role play it you know if I was to do this, um so that I give the players an understanding that hey this is not just a a tool of how to beat your enemy there's a reason why as a monk you're given this, um but that, that's why I like stuff it's a it's a very very cool spiritual aspect to this ability that, that I like a lot. That 
you know, that I haven't seen, I haven't seen before. Um, I'll go ahead and read Extort True. At sixth level, you can hit a hidden cluster of nerves on a creature with precision, temporarily causing them to become mentally malleable. If you hit a creature with an unarmed attack, you can spend one key point to force them to make a charisma saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is unable to speak a deliberate lie, and all charisma checks directed at the creature are made with advantage for up to 10 minutes. You know if they succeeded or failed on their saving throw. An affected creature is aware of the effect and can, can thus avoid answering questions to which it would normally respond with a lie. Such a creature, such a creature can be evasive in its answers as long as the effect lasts. I know there's spells that can do this effect as, as well, but I, I again I like the role playing uh, flavor to it. The, uh, the 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 fact that you could extract truth a different way. What what do you think? Um, it, it has that uh, zone of truth vibe, but it gives you to like one specific target, and instead of just specifically like getting the truths or lies, uh, you also get the advantage on the saving uh the charisma check so you're not just getting the person to admit stuff you're also able to manipulate the person so uh, that's the like maybe not huge but slightly different aspect of this versus like say zone of truth and i i do like that i like that idea of like you are a knowledgeable person you are able to physically and now mentally be able to manipulate a thing or a creature to some level <laughs> okay mystical erudition beginning at sixth level you've undergone extensive training with the cobalt soul teaching you extensively in history or lore from the monastery's collective volumes you learn one language of your choice and you gain one and you gain proficiency with one of the following skills of your choice arcana history investigation nature and religion if you already have proficiency in one of those listed skills you can instead choose to double your proficiency bonus to any skill to any ability check you make that uses the chosen proficiency. You gain additional language and additional skill proficiency from the above list with the ability to double the bonus of an existing proficiency from that list at 11th and 17th level. So these are both, so extort truth and this are both level six things that you get. So uh, it's not like this is by itself, but you're gaining a language, which if you are a researcher, that makes sense. And then you are learning to be a little more proficient with the skill, which also I think makes sense, especially if you're not just like a wizened monk, you're also a historian or someone who seeks knowledge. I, I think this does make sense. It's not physically flashy, but it could be very useful for gaining knowledge to the point you were making earlier with like um, that you were talking about with the uh, uh, extract aspects. Yeah. Yeah, this definitely is not like you said before, not a, a physically flashy character. It's it's I could see I could see some players having a great time with it, but I could see a lot of if you're into hack and slash, maybe this may not be uh the most exciting cl uh subclass to choose. But I I I like it so far. Mind of Mercury. Starting at eleventh starting at eleventh level, you've honed your awareness and reflexes through mental aptitude and pattern recognition. Once per turn, if you're already taking a reaction, you may spend one key point to take an additional reaction. Okay, that that is cool. I like that. Yeah. I mean, when you add that with either opportunity attacks or with extort truth, where if a creature um, tries to hit you, not extort truth, um, extract aspects, if someone tries to hit you, you can use a reaction to hit them back. So basically it makes you go from just having the normal, you know, three two attacks plus the other two attacks of a monk you now have your opportunity attack and potentially more so you can have five plus attacks as a monk now uh depending on how many key points you want to spend in a turn hmm, interesting all right and an additional mystical uh, erudition yeah so uh at 11th and 17th you get another language and then another skill proficiency okay interesting all right and debilitating barrage. And upon reaching its 17th level, you gain the knowledge of to temporarily lower a creature's fortitude by striking a series of pressure points. Whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows, you can spend three key points to cause the creature to suffer a vulnerability to a damage type of your choice for one minute, or until they take damage of that type. A creature who is affected by this feature cannot be affected by it again for 24 hours. At 17th level, 
Hmm. I don't know. It, it's it's well. First thing we say, cool ability, but I don't know for seventeenth level. I would. I don't know. To me, that's more like eleven, fourteenth, maybe. I don't know. I to give a vulnerability. I mean, I guess it depends. Uh, I seventeenth uh, might be a little too high, but I like. I still think it would be above eleventh level because if you can give like vulnerability to anything, and you have somebody that like is like really down with a specific type. Like if you have like a red dragon sorcerer who like is just really baller at fire, <laughs> like just really good at fire. Um, like you guys could have like a one, two combo, but like if that was a lower level thing, like imagine like going against I'm trying to picture like something that you could go against, but like, give something uh, like lightning vulnerability and then someone just like explodes lightning all over them. I don't know. Like I, I wouldn't argue with it being lower. I think 11th is a little too low, but yeah. I, I can understand thinking 17th is too high too though. Like, yeah, but this, this would make, this will make this character subclass, this subclass really amazing. It's really that that could be taken and, and used in so many interesting ways, that ability. Um, yeah, that's it's a great ability. I, I I have to think about that more. About like, can that ability be broken? Because it it could be. I mean, you could fight something normally incredibly strong, and then give it something new that your your party is very good at doing. <laughs> um, um, well, I have to think about that. But it's, it's, I I like I like it. It it might be. I, I don't know if it might be too powerful, but I I. I like the idea of it. Makes sense. Um, yeah, the spell that I think of when I when I hear this is disintegrate. So if you imagine like someone like someone's like, yeah, I'm gonna give you vulnerability to um to what is it acid, force mm. damage. Be like, yeah, I'm gonna give you vulnerability to force damage. Like you automatically take forty damage from disintegrate. So now that's eighty damage, and that's not even you rolling dice yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think you could find fun ways to break this. I agree. Like 17th, 17 does seem too high. I think specifically when you think about certain spells, but you have to remember that these are just the, the monk abilities you're getting from this. This isn't including all the other abilities you normally get as a monk. That's true. Um, have you seen this played at Critical Role a lot? This is this, this used a lot? Yeah, this has been used since the beginning of the campaign, basically. So... Um, the extract aspects I've seen develop. The, all of these have changed, so um, I forget which one. I think extract aspects you used to also do like one d10 psychic damage, while also extracting aspects. Um, and, and like some things have been changed, uh, but we never saw a lot of the crazy or high level stuff before those got changed. Um, extract aspects get used a lot. Extort truth has been used a couple times. Um, and Mystic Erudition, uh, the character uh, Beauregard is a monk in the cobalt soul and uh she has made great use of her investigating and history and arcana proficiencies that have saved certain aspects of the camp not campaign certain aspects of uh character choices completely changed because of the knowledge that she is one of the couple that can gather from it um but like being part of the Cobalt Soul, if your uh, DM is doing it well, I'm not saying that a DM would do it badly, but um, the Cobalt Soul itself is supposed to be these havens of knowledge. So uh, being able to have that as a resource, as a character for your party is also something that even though it's not technically like a feature on here, is technically a feature of your character where you could go and, you know, you have this infinite library to do research in, which could help at certain points hmm. okay i i um i it, it, this this subclass is interesting enough to me that i want to actually look for specific episodes of critical role and see how this works i um, can provide them because <laughs> <laughs> i i like the i mean the one thing one thing about monsters is that what makes them great in your in campaigns is that you don't know what's going on you don't know anything about them how to defeat them, especially, and this is, I think, would be a great tool for uh, certain parties, so that if they're worried about that, they have someone that's that's that can help with that situ those type of situations. So that, to me, that's very exciting. Because as a dungeon master, 
that to me gives me more challenges uh, for for me to deal with my players. I I because I, I like a little bit of, like pullback between player and dungeon master. You know, I like them. I want them to outsmart me. Um, so it's it's um, something like this. It's to me, it's exciting for that reason. And that's the thing too is that you always have a chance to throw something new at them because uh, maybe you know they fight let's say a, a white dragon once um, and they beat it, but barely, but they never decide to use these type of abilities. That first time they fight like a young, young dragon, they, they kill it, but they never extract aspects of it. So they don't know these things. But the second time around, they're like, wait, if I use this, we'll actually know how to beat this stupid thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it gives chances for characters to, if they mess up the first time, maybe second time, you know, maybe you fight, a uh, certain type of orc or a goliath or like uh dwarves that are like snow like cold resistant for some reason and you can learn these things over time yeah exactly um all right this is great um to our viewers out there let us know uh what you think of these subclasses um let us know your opinions below have you used them have you what you think of about them in critical role do you feel like they're overpowered underpowered um let us know in the comments below and thank you all for watching have a safe day.